He's one of America's top legal scholars, building a top law school at UC Irvine. Erwin Shemarinsky on campus hate speech, crime and punishment, the U.S. Supreme Court, Orange County's DA, and more, next on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Memorial Care is transforming the way healthcare is delivered, keeping our communities and businesses healthy by guiding them on the path to wellness with easily accessible hospitals, physician offices, and outpatient centers. Memorial Care, leading the way. Hi, I'm Rick Reef. Welcome to Inside OC. Well, to call Erwin Shemarinsky a legal scholar is a bit of an understatement. He's the second most cited legal scholar in the entire country. And when he's not writing academic papers, he's writing books or newspaper editorials or arguing before the U.S. Supreme Court or spending lots of time in the classroom. He's founding dean of UC Irvine's law school, which is just eight years old, but moving up in the national rankings. Oh, and also notable in conservative-leaning Orange County, Professor Shemarinsky is a proud liberal. Joining me, Dean of UCI's Law School, Erwin Shemarinsky. Professor, great to have you back. It's wonderful to be with you. Something else you're noted for. Uh, you were a, a, a daily commentator for months uh, back when the O.J. Simpson trial was going on. Suddenly, a lot of renewed interest in the O.J. We've had a reality show. There's a movie. Um, tell us, uh, you were at USC at the time. Uh, that was really a big deal. It was an amazing experience. The murders occurred in June of 1994. The verdict was in October of 1995. And it really took over my life for that time period. And it was fascinating to watch. It was a compelling story with an amazing cast of characters. I think that's why there's the renewed interest in it now. It renewed because it's been a passage of time and it's a new story for many people? It's a new story for many people, and for those who followed it then, they've forgotten a lot of the details. And as I said, it really was an amazing story, and it had an incredible cast of characters. That's what makes the new made-for-TV movie series, or even the movie. Yeah, and so i got to ask you, do you think he was guilty? He was guilty. I followed every minute of the trial. Sometimes I was in the courtroom. Often I was on a set watching, but I was in class, I'd read the transcripts. I think the evidence was clear, and that's why when there was a civil jury, it found that he'd committed the murders. So why did he get off on the murder rap? I think it's a complicated story. I think some of it is that the prosecution overtried its case. I think it needed to present a much simpler story to the jury. Some of it is about race. There was then, there is now, great distrust of the Los Angeles police and the African American community. Ten of the jurors were black, and the defense made the argument that O.J. Simpson was framed, and that was something that resonated with the jury. But the glove didn't fit. We'll never know what happened there, but I think everyone would agree that Chris Darden, one of the prosecutors, made a huge mistake in having O.J. Simpson try on the glove. Yeah, okay. So you think maybe it just shrunk or something over time, or O.J.'s hand was uh, swollen or what? Uh, I mean, it just, the glove, that was a good line, though, right? As an attorney watching Johnny uh, Cochran, did you say, this guy's unbelievable? Johnny what? Cochran was a terrific lawyer. And, of course, the very famous line, if it does not fit, you must acquit, has been part of popular culture ever since. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's, uh, something else you have done, I reference it, you've argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. How many times, I, 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 Probably dozens of briefs, right? But how many times have you actually been there before the Supreme Court? I've argued five times in the Five United times? Court. Wow, that's a lot. It's been an amazing experience, and it's really incredible to get to stand before the justices yeah. knowing that your argument is part of making the law. It's intimidating. It's exhilarating. It's frustrating because the justices have very little respect for one another's questions. So you get a question from one justice, and before you can say more than a sentence or two, you had a question of another justice on something else. Throughout the argument, kind of go back, okay, how can I answer that question that I didn't fully respond to? I would love to be a fly on the wall when uh, you are talking, or when you would 
would be talking before Antonin Scalia, the conservative bastion of the, of the Supreme Court. Now, uh, what was your experience with him? I met him on several occasions. I didn't know him well. He certainly wasn't a friend. In terms of arguing in the Supreme Court, for each of the cases I argued, I knew that he wasn't going to be a vote on my side. So I developed a very conscious strategy that when he would ask me a question, I would not look at him in responding. My tendency as a professor is to look at who's asking me the question. He would ask me a question, I'd try to look away. So I didn't get an extended one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, which would never be to my benefit. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it tough? Is it, uh, uh, do you always get that kind of nervous feeling when you're going up before the oh, U.S. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but I still get a nervous feeling whenever I argue in court. I argued a case in the California Court of Appeal on April 26th. And I had the nervous feeling before that. I think something would be wrong if I didn't have the nervous yeah. feeling. I think it's part of taking it very seriously. Of all the cases you've argued, is there one that you really feel proud of that maybe it went, uh, you were able to turn around the justices or you just really were able to make a, a strong point? I think the case that I argued in the Supreme Court that I'm most proud of, I lost. It was a challenge to California's three strikes law. My client, Leandro Andrade, had been sentenced to 50 years to life in prison for stealing $150,000 worth of videotapes. He was the first person um, to come before the Supreme Court on this. In fact, no one in the history of the United States had ever received a life sentence for shoplifting until California's three strikes law. I represented him in the Federal Court of Appeals in one, and then the state of California sought and got Supreme Court review, and I lost five to four. But I'm still proud of having been the advocate in that case. Why do you think you lost? because five justices voted against me. <laughs> uh, you know, it was a 5-4 decision. It was split uh -huh. along wow. ideological lines. Wow. Um, Justice O'Connor wrote, joined by Chief Justice Rehnquist, yeah. and Justice Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas. Justice Stevens wrote the dissent on my side, joined by Justice Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer. The majority felt there should be great deference to state governments in deciding punishment. The dissent felt 50 years to life for shoplifting was too much time for too little crime, to paraphrase Johnny Cochran. Is it, yeah, but isn't the argument, they always say, you know, it's the guy, he stole a pizza, it's his third strike. But typically, they've done things in the past that got them to that point. Is there anything really unconstitutional about saying, you know, if you've been a bad guy, a uh, bad person this many times, you know, when you do it again, we don't care if you're jaywalking, you're, you're going to jail. Yes, because the punishment has to be proportionate to the crime. Of course, it's permissible to take into account his prior offenses. My client had three prior convictions for residential burglary of unoccupied homes. He served two and a half years in prison, and then he stole these videotapes. In fact, California, a few years ago, changed its three strikes law so that now the third strike has to be a serious or violent felony. And are you, are you fine with that? Oh, I think the California law was changed in exactly the right way, okay. that it should be a serious or violent felony. I don't oppose the three strikes law. I oppose putting a person in prison for life for the third crime being stealing a slice of pizza yeah. or stealing $153 okay. worth of videotapes. You referenced the five to four vote. That's be, that's, on so many swing cases, that's been the case. We now have the death of Antonin Scalia. You've got a 4-4 four, four court. People are saying this next presidential election as far as the Supreme Court goes, to paraphrase Trump, is huge, that it's huge. Do you agree? I completely agree. I think there's no more important issue for the November 2016 presidential election than who's likely to fill three or four seats on the Supreme Court. Since 1960, 79 years old is the average age which a justice has left the bench. By coincidence, Justice Scalia was 79 when he passed away on February 13th. We will have three justices who are 79 or older in 2017, the year the next president is inaugurated. And we don't know if Justice Scalia's seat will be filled. So when you think of the next president, especially if he or she uh -huh. serves for two terms, uh -huh. having four seats to fill on the Supreme Court it will affect literally every constitutional issue, it will affect all of our rights. So if you're a conservative, uh, presumably you're not, uh, you know, even if you think Trump is a dice roll, you'll, you, you, have, you have a strong reason to consider voting for him. And obviously, if you're liberal, you're going to want the Democrat who's likely to be Hillary Clinton. That's right. To say that this is the most important issue is not at all ideological, because I think for both Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, who fills those seats on the Supreme Court is going to make all the difference 
as to all of the issues. Okay. Well, I think people uh, by now viewers have a sense of why you're such an engaging commentator and a and a tremendous teacher. So tell us about the uh, the law school at UC Irvine. Thank you. It's going great. We just graduated our fifth class. Our eighth entering class will start in August. We're continuing to get wonderful external recognition. Not long ago, our faculty was ranked sixth in the country in scholarly impact behind Yale, Harvard, University of Chicago, New York University, and Stanford. Just last Friday, we were ranked second in the country in placing our graduates in government and public interest jobs. Two weeks ago, we were ranked fifth in the country over the last three years in placing our students in prestigious judicial clerkships. U.S. News ranked us 28th of the 200-some law schools in the country overall, and that's in just our second year of being ranked, and I think we're going to continue to move up dramatically. Right. In fact, your very first year, two years ago, you were ranked 30th, right. which is a heck of a way to debut, and now you've already jumped to 28th. But I do recall when you first started the school, you wanted to be ranked 20. You wanted to be in the top 20, so you didn't quite make it. Uh, you're, you're getting there. Are, I, is, was that just like a goal you set that can't be achieved, or uh, you know, is it kind of like, well, it's not quite where we want to be? Um, to debut 30 or to be 28 is a wonderful way to be. And I absolutely believe in a very short time we will achieve the goal of being a top 20 law school. And so I think my saying that was to convey an important message to prospective students, prospective faculty, prospective employers. This is the kind of law school we're going to be from the beginning. I think we're achieving that, and in terms of the ranking, I think we'll be within the top 20 very soon. So now I'm sure there's some viewers out there, and myself, I'm wondering, God, but don't we already have too many lawyers? Is, isn't America too litigious a society? Do we really need more lawyers? Well, we have too many lawyers. We don't have enough good lawyers. And we certainly don't have enough lawyers who are working to help people in society. And I think of all the statistics about my law school I'm proud of, and you can tell there's many, the fact that the students who graduated on May 6th, 92% did pro bono work while they were in law school. Of all the students we've had in our seven years of students, 92% of them have done volunteer work in law school. That's in addition to their clinics, in addition to their coursework, in addition to their externships. And so I'm hoping that we're going to produce a group of lawyers who are really going to serve the public. There's not nearly enough lawyers doing that. Let's talk about um, a couple of issues. One that you have uh, you have uh, uh, a uh, a lot of nuanced views on is this whole idea of free speech versus hate speech. On the college campuses, there's protests, students wanting to express themselves, other students saying, wait a second, express yourself, but don't offend me, I want a safe zone. How do you come down on all of that? All ideas can be expressed on a college campus no matter how offensive they may be. On the other hand, there's no right to threaten others, to cause people to fear for their safety, or to harass others. And so to me, that's the basic principle. Ideas and views always can be expressed, but there's never a right to threaten somebody, never a right to harass somebody. But isn't one person's protest another person's threat? In other words, it's great to say, you know, I, we all agree you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, but even a very aggressive, offensive type of statement, it seems that on the college campuses now, they're saying you can't say that because that's a threat to me. I very much disagree with that. I think there is a difference between expressing ideas, even forcefully, and a threat. What's a threat? It's something that causes a person to reasonably fear for her, his or her safety. I have no right to assault you and make you feel threatened. And there's no right to do that on a college campus. What troubles me is now there's attempts to censor the expression of ideas. And that's not a threat. There's a professor at Northwestern, where I just learned we both uh -huh. went, named Laura Kipnis, who wrote an article in the Journal of Chronicle of Higher Education last year, in which she said that women students are asking for too much protection from the university. And she objected to Northwestern having a rule preventing sexual relationships with faculty and students. As a result of publishing that article, some women graduate students at Northwestern filed a complaint against her at the Office of Civil Rights saying she was creating a hostile environment. She had the First Amendment right to say that. You can't censor somebody because you find their speech offensive. So, so what was the outcome of that case? Ultimately, after months of investigation, she was cleared. But there are instances on college campuses all over the country where students are saying that speech should be punished or silenced because it's offensive. 
That's wrong under the First Amendment. You can't ever stop speech just because it's offensive, even deeply offensive. The, the fact that a uh, the, the person you just mentioned at Northwestern had to go through that ordeal, all right, she's cleared, but she's going through months of investigations and things. To me, it seems like the whole attitude on the college campus has swung too much toward, uh, I want to be protected, don't offend me. Uh, I mean, is that more of the attitude now? I think that's right, and I, I'm disturbed by that attitude. Obviously, we want a conducive learning environment for all students. I admire the students who are trying to make sure that the campus is inclusive and welcoming for all, but it can't be by censoring speech because it's offensive. And I am troubled like you are that every week there's another incident somewhere in the country of students wanting to silence the speech that they think is offensive, that they call a microaggression. That's not permissible under the First Amendment. I draw the line at yeah. if it's a threat, if it's harassment, then that's not protected. Now, now do you find, um, is this attitude, does it cut across uh, ideological lines, or do you find that when you talk, as you're talking now, about having free, vigorous, even at the expense of uh, offensive speech, that you're finding you have more allies in that on the right than on the left? I think it depends on who you're talking to. Probably among commentators, I'd have more allies on the right than on the left. Among college students, what I found is it cuts across ideology. The chancellor at UCI, Howard Gilman, and I taught a freshman seminar on free speech on college campuses. And we were stunned that all 15 students came down very much on the side of restricting speech to protect student sensibilities, and were not so much on the side of freedom of speech. And we realized that some of it is, this is the first generation to grow up being instructed against bullying. They've internalized that message. Also, freedom of speech is more of an abstraction for them. We were talking earlier about the anti-Vietnam War protests when we were in college. We remember the civil rights protests. For current students, that's as long ago as World War I was for our generation. Yeah. That's kind of scary, though, isn't it? Uh, I, what do you make of this? What's the matter with kids today? What, what do you make of these millennials? Well, what I make of it is I admire their desire to create a campus that's welcoming and inclusive for all students, but I worry that they don't really understand freedom of speech, and they want to put far too much trust in campus officials to punish and regulate speech. Yeah, boy. Okay, let's... Uh, uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, the district attorney of Orange County, Tony Rokakis, who you have, uh, you've butted heads with him on a couple of things. Um, talk about the, uh, the, your call for the federal, and you joining with many other uh, legal scholars and calling for a federal investigation of this jail informant scandal. John Van de Kamp and I wrote a letter to Loretta Lynch, the attorney general, this past November. Judge Thomas Gothels found that the Orange County District Attorney's Office violated the Constitution in the murder prosecution of Scott Decry, that they used jailhouse informants in a way that violated the Constitution, that it wasn't disclosed to the defense as the Constitution requires. We still do not know how many cases were tainted by this unconstitutional behavior. We don't know how many potentially innocent people were convicted. There needs to be a thorough investigation. And so John Van de Kamp and I wrote this letter that 25 individuals, conservative and liberal, former prosecutors and defense counsel, signed on to. What kind of feedback, again, I, I referenced earlier too, you are the liberal scholar in conservative-leaning Orange County. Do you take a lot of flack for that? Or do you get letters, I'm never giving a dollar to the Irvine Law School? Oh, of course I get those letters. On the other hand, there are also people who are, I think, become donors of the law school because of the kind of things, but it's got to remember, the law school has no ideology. Some of our largest donors are very conservative in ideology, and no law school, no university should have an ideology. I obviously have my views, but the law school is a place where all views should be expressed. Well, I, I know that, but again, you are the, you are the marquee, and, um, and you know, so do people react to that? I, I, you know. uh, sure they do. But I have been in Orange County now for eight years. I could not be more warmly welcomed by Orange County than I've yeah. been. I write a weekly column in the Orange County Register and I express my views. Obviously, it is opinion pieces should generate responses, but that's a good thing. Yeah. Now, when you talked about the donors, uh, the, of course, the first and biggest donor were Donald Bren, yes. uh, a chairman, CEO of the Irvine Company, who gave $20 million to set up the school. 
we don't have enough time to go into the whole history of when you were recruited and then the chancellor uh, you know, said, well, I'm gonna unrecruit you and then he re recruits you. Ancient history. All right, ancient history. But there were some bad feelings about that. Have you ever talked with Donald Brent? Have you ever met him and spoken with him? I have him? met him. Um, we certainly communicated. I try whenever there's accomplishments in the law school to let him know. His gift was crucial in letting us recruit a top faculty from the very beginning. And uh, have you talked to him recently? Or? I don't have regular conversations yeah. with him, um, but certainly always will send to him notices about accomplishments of the law school and our faculty. They, are things thawing, let me ask you Oh, I you think they way. have. Yeah. I've perceived no hostility ever from Mr. Bren. Are you hoping he'll give you another check sometime? <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay. Um, going back to the campus discussion for a moment, um, uh, is, uh, is there too much emphasis nowadays on college campuses on diversity? Every time I hear a major uh, official at a university speak, it's diversity. Of course, we all want diversity. But a, a college campus is also sp supposed to be about academic excellence. Do you sacrifice some excellence when you are focused on diversity? Absolutely not. Um, excellence has many measures. No college has ever accepted students just based on grades and test scores. It's always been easy to get Harvard or Yale if you're North Dakota or Wyoming than if you're Boston or New York City because they value geographic diversity. I'm sure that the football players at USC don't have the same grades and test scores because they add something else to the college campus. Well, diversity really matters. Um, I think we've proven that at UCI Law School. We're 12th on the US News Index of Diversity, 50% of our students of color. But by every measure, our students are truly excellent. We have a very diverse faculty that I'm proud of. And yet I told you that our faculty is ranked sixth in the country of all yeah. law schools in terms of scholarly impact. There is no tension between diversity and excellence. Okay. Speaking of excellence, Cybersecurity Institute, UCI is yes. doing something, and I'm thinking Erwin Chemerinsky is going to work for the CIA. I mean, what's going on here? I am really proud of Dick. We had a meeting last Friday of 65 people. It included the chief of the Los Angeles Police Department, Charlie Beck, representatives from the Department of Homeland Security and the Secret Service, the Orange County Sheriff's Office, the LA County Sheriff's Office. Big business was represented there. We had people from companies like American Express and Rockwell and Boeing. We had leading privacy experts from the Electronic Freedom Foundation and the ACLU. We had lawyers representing law right. firms. And we're creating a cybersecurity institute. It's jointly of seven schools on campus. It's the law school, information and computer science, engineering, social science, social ecology, physical sciences, and the business school. I think the medical school get involved. We want to be a university-based, interdisciplinary think tank with regard to issues of cybersecurity. Chief Charlie Beck said at the meeting, soon we will be at the point where over half of all crime in the United States is cybercrime. We need to work together, and I think a university is an ideal place to do this. So what are some of the areas that you see the law school being involved in when it comes to cybersecurity? One of the key things we need to do is to balance privacy interests with law enforcement needs. We saw that very vividly in the conflict between Apple and the FBI and the Justice Department as to whether or not Apple was going to be able to break the encryption on the phone. And how do we balance privacy and security? I think a law school can play a key role in that regard. And of course, there's the technical aspect of this. There we need information and computer science and engineering and cryptologists in the math department. Yeah. What else, uh, what else is going on at the law school? Well, we were also creating another institute, a civil justice research institute. I've raised about a million dollars since January for this. We're in the process now of getting an executive director. What's happened over recent years is there have been obstacles created for injured people having access to the courts. And again, I think we need an independent, university-based think tank to make sure that we have the best way of protecting people who are hurt. Something else, uh, uh, speaking of civil justice, is all of the uh, protests about uh, alleged police violence and uh, racism in, uh, in the police departments. We're seeing in Baltimore where the, uh, uh, all these cases are being dropped. Uh, is this a false narrative that, that the big problem in, uh, uh, in the inner city is racist white cops shooting young black men in cold blood? As with everything, the story is so much more nuanced than that. There is racism in policing. There is racism in law enforcement. 
On the other hand, a police officer faces an enormously difficult task. And so I don't think it's just about racism and policing, but to deny there's racism and policing is to ignore a social problem. But it, it, we, it's been elevated to number one problem, it seems. And I, I just don't see the evidence there that this is the number one issue. Again, it's when you say number one that I pause. I don't think it's the number one issue, but it's still an important issue. And we do have what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, or what happened in Staten Island, New York, or what happened to Freddie Gray in Baltimore. When do the police cross the line and use excessive force? Okay. Well, Professor, thanks so much. And uh, you are nuanced. Uh, even before you're liberal, you are nuanced. Uh, thank so thanks you. again. Great, Such great having pleasure. you on. Well, that's it for now. Thanks again to my guest, UCI Law School Dean Erwin Shemarinsky. You can watch this show and past shows by going to pbsocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter on YouTube. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Memorial Care is transforming the way healthcare is delivered, keeping our communities and businesses healthy by guiding them on the path to wellness with easily accessible hospitals, physician offices, and outpatient centers. Memorial Care, leading the way.